What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the 585 Report. Mitch Broder here alongside Ryan Sullivan. And uh, it's definitely, you know, not the easiest Tuesday to wake up to after last night. It was um, a very uh, well-played game, I think, on both ends. Just, I mean, I'll, I'll just say this objectively speaking from, from a non-fan perspective. It was a great game. Um, very entertaining, very close. But as a Bills fan, it definitely stings, Ryan, especially for the fact that, you know, this was a team that had the Bills number a season ago. Uh, of course, we probably saw that, you know, Derek Henry stiff arm on Josh Norman a million times. They even showed it a few times last night. They always have to reference the music to the miracle when they play these guys. So that's the one that annoyed me. They had to go and do it in pregame, but Adam Schefter took our side. So that was nice to see. That's good. And, and, and Hey, you know, they tried it here this year and, and they finally called the forward lateral. It was 21 <laughs> years late, but at least they called it or 22 years late. But Anyways, you know, so it's always good to beat these Titans, but Ryan, it just it just didn't happen for him last night. Uh, my first question is, what time did you get to bed last night? Because, you know, one of the nice things when he went for that, I was like, all right, nice. It's not going to be overtime and I can go to bed. It was like what, 1130 when it ended. And then I spent two hours arguing with people on Twitter about why, about the, the merits of going for it on fourth down and i i think i ended up texting you at like 12 30 and you responded back so what time did you end up going to bed last night oh, gosh um I, I, I you know i don't even know i think it might have been like 132 probably because like after a game like that too because the end i mean you're you know your heart's racing the adrenaline's going it takes a while to just like calm down and be able to like because even when i got in bed lights off of course i still like Got to see what's going on on Twitter. Got to see what people are, you know, and they're still arguing about the call. So, um, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I was people. I was people. <laughs> yeah. So, I, yeah, probably like two in the morning. I don't know, man. But, it, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of just laying in bed in the dark, just like thinking about the game. Now, are you are, are you a one o'clock? Because I think there's a lot of one o'clock purists I didn't realize existed. And I have to say, I enjoy when the Bills play in prime time, not because it's national TV, but I enjoy, A, it allows me to get some errands done in the morning as opposed to doing them after the Bills game. And I enjoy sitting there and watching Red Zone or just watching other games of teams I normally don't get to watch. Are you, are you a 1 o'clock purist or do, do you enjoy the primetime games? Like, of course, like the 1 o'clock games, just because like that's just always been the Bills slot because we were never primetime worthy. I've, I I don't know if I would say I'm a purist, but maybe I'm like a little bit of a creature of habit. So like I'm used to just the you know, waking up in the morning, turning all the pregame stuff, you know, getting ready for like the inactives to come out. And then like it being, you know, okay, it's 430. I can go like figure out dinner or we'll get, you know, work done or whatever. But um, I, I like that they have the primetime games sprinkled in there because especially like I feel like Bills fans, like we've been like screaming for for these kind of a games for decades. So like I don't want to complain that we have them because the fact that we have this many primetime games it's because we're good. So it's like, you know, like this is what happens. So I guess to answer your question, I'm not a one o'clock purist, but like, that's certainly like when I'm in my like routine, like the, uh, the Sunday night thing, like the Sunday night football, I think I can adjust to a little bit better than the Monday night, the Monday night, the, the long waiting time for the game, like just starts, was eating at me like all Monday while I was like trying to like get stuff done. I don't know about yeah. you. Yeah. It's definitely, it's a cloud hanging over you during the day. And, uh, but though I, I do enjoy it cause I get to watch, I normally don't watch the ESPN pregame show, but I think ESPN, uh, is one of the few pregame shows that has really got it right. And maybe it's just cause I really mm -hmm. like Randy. I think, I don't know. I think they've done a really good job of getting that pregame show. And I really like the booth, even without the Manning, I like the booth that they put together there and, uh, not as good as the Buffalo fanatics pregame show, but of course the second best pregame show for the bills on the, the market. I think they've really done a good job. So it gives me an excuse to, uh, to watch that absolutely absolutely but ryan i feel like we you know we got to talk about probably what kept us up at night though obviously uh that 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 the the play of the game let's just put it that way it was what this game came down to that fourth and in inches that that came up short for for buffalo and of course that sparked not just a bait among bill's mafia but among national media was that the right move for you know by Sean McDermott? So Ryan, I ask you, was that the right call by Coach McDermott? 
so there's two parts to this call. It's was going for it the right decision, and then there's was the play call the right decision. And to both, I say absolutely. Both were the right decision. Let's start with the first one. Going for it was the right decision. I'll use this moment to get on my soapbox. And if you follow me on Twitter, you know that I'm on. NFL overtime is stupid. Sudden death. I, I, this fact that you can score a touchdown and the other team never touches the ball, I absolutely hate it. I think college has it almost perfect. If there was a system where at least make it so the first touchdown doesn't end the game. At least give the other team a chance to get the ball back. And it, I just hate NFL overtime in, in a game. And I'll touch in this later when I get into some of the things that went wrong. But in the second half, the Bills defense was not getting stops, period. They, the, the Tennessee was doing what they wanted to do, just like the Bills offense was doing what they wanted to do. So when it's fourth and inches at that spot and you have a 6-6 quarterback who, who excels in running in the red zone, excels in those situations, you go for it. You go for the win. I, you know, I, I meme and troll and coaches who are cowards in that situation all the time. Playing for overtime is never the right move because you're leaving it to a coin flip. If you, if you look at the numbers, a lot of the numbers from next gen stats and Ben Baldwin and those guys back that up. So starting there, before even getting to the play, going for it in that spot, I think made sense analytically. And I think just, common sense just go for the win get it done with don't leave it up to a coin toss i ryan i mean i i agree with you i if i was sean mcdermott okay in that position i would have done the exact same thing i would have gone for it i would have called the same play too i would have 100 percent. i even said it. i was watching the game with a couple of my buddies i had them over and I even said when they when they said it was be fourth and inches, I said I hope they just do an Allen QB sneak. I said that out loud because if you look at the stats, Ryan, if you look at the statistics, right, and the and, and the probability of Josh Allen converting on a fourth and inches QB sneak, it's like ninety percent of the time it's that he gets it nine out of ten times he's getting you that first down. And I kind of just chalk it up to that was the one out of ten times, the one time out of nine or ten, whatever that it just didn't work. And I think that sometimes, like, listen, of course, could you nitpick maybe that Allen picked the wrong path? Should he just follow the Morse up the middle instead of trying to do that, like, kick it out to the, bounce it out to the side thing that he's that he's sort of falling in love with a little bit? You know, yeah, you can make that argument. But at the end of the day, if he doesn't slip, who knows what happens? I mean, we're talking about a six foot five, 240-pound quarterback that is proven that he's a, a beast in short yard situations running the football, Okay. You gotta like your chances with him leaning forward that he can pick up that first down. So I think for the people that were trying to say that that was a bad, bad, you know, first of all, the decision, Ryan, I agree with you one hundred percent. I think it was I don't know if it was Kendall or Clay who tweeted this. So I'm sorry who, who which one of you two tweeted, but you, but they put it perfectly. They said, "Would you rather put the game in the hands of a coin flip or your MVP quarterback?" No, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. Who, who are you picking? I mean, come on, it's it's an easy decision, and. You know, and th- this this stat comes from uh, PFF Sam. I've got his last name, but PFF Sam. I'm sure everyone recognizes him if you're on Twitter. Josh Allen's done 32 third and fourth down quarterback sneaks over the course of his career. You know how many he's converted? 29. He is 29 of 32 over the course of his career on quarterback sneaks. And to the point that he shouldn't have gone left, it, it, if you check the tape, it seems like that's the way he always prefers to go. And, you know, I think that th- this is what would have happened if he they didn't do the sneak. Let's say they do an RPO and they run it out of shotgun. Let's say they they get cute and they do a, a pin and pull, which they kind of abandoned in this game, or they try to do a pass and it doesn't work. Everyone is jumping down Dable's throat today saying, well, why didn't you just sneak it with your 6'5 quarterback? Yep. It's That's what gets me. It, it It is a slam dunk play over the course of his career that that has just panned out. And I, I don't, I guess, I think, you know, we both agree here. And so there's not a whole lot more to say on it that I, I rather, I rather go down like that going for a win than playing for the tie, you know, or go try and play and play for overtime because you don't have control over that coin flip. And 
you know, McDermott said it best. Uh, I'll always ride. I'll, oh, you know, I'll always bet on Josh, whatever his quote was last night. And it, I think you can't say it any better than that. It was just, it, it, I, I would do it. I, I would support the call again. I would support the exact play call in that situation. And I think it would work next time. It was just a freak play. It lo- that almost never happens to Josh and good for McDermott for doing it. Good for him for going into the press conference and backing it up. And if it comes again, I'll be ready to support it with the exact same veracity. Yeah, absolutely. Because again, I think the people who are just to quickly add on that kind of before we move on, because like I said, you, you know, we agree on this. So there's not much debate here between you and me. I mean, obviously, like you said, if, if the, for overtime, whoever got the ball was going to win the game, plain and simple, because the bills weren't stopping Derrick Henry. They were struggling with that offense so you have that. And then I just, in general, like, I just feel like this criticism, right. Of, of why they go for it. It's just classic, you know, as the saying goes, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, right. That's what it is. Of course, in hindsight, it didn't work. So of course you can criticize it. But like you said, if they had tried to do like that play, they tried to do to Brita week one against the Steelers that people ripped apart relentlessly that fourth and one, where they did the fake QB sneak and like tossed it out in the flats, right. They got blown up right? I would much rather die on something like last night than try mm-hmm. something like kind of cute and, and, and ridiculous like that, that we saw in week one. And not to mention for 20 years, I feel like we had seen the bills always be that team that just plays for the field goal. We'll just take it to overtime. And that got us into a 17 year playoff drought. So I like that. Mick Durham said, F that I got myself an MVP quarterback. While I put my full faith into and I believe he can get us a yard. And again, it didn't work. It didn't happen this time. But like you mentioned, I love that McDermott backed up his players 100% about that decision and that he would do it 10 times out of 10 because I agree I would do the same. And it, yeah, I, I think it's one of these things that in the heat of the moment, Bill's Mafia is very upset about. But once you let it process it, I feel like people will start to kind of come around and realize, listen, it was just kind of an unfortunate situation. Simmons had a great penetration through Dawkins and Feliciano. Allen lost his footing, and it resulted in not getting the first down. Yep, and, and you know, this can kind of transition us into what else went wrong in this game. The last, the last what is this, five drives of this game for Tennessee was touchdown, 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 field goal, touchdown. I don't. If you're McDermott, I don't blame him for not having trust in his defense there. It was just, there was no stops coming in that half. Ryan Tannehill was nine of nine down the stretch for 109 yards, I think was was the stat. AJ Brown was running wide open. Uh, you know, third and fourth string wide receivers were running wide open. And the Bills defense just kind of started to fall apart at, at the end of the game there. And, you know, I, I think also just given the state of the game, the, you know, when you add the context, the defense wasn't playing well. It, I think it just makes that much more sense. It makes it that much more of an easy decision for McDermott. Yeah, abs- absolutely, one hundred percent. They with the way the defense was kind of falling apart there, which, like you said, that kind of puts us right to what we want to talk about here, which is some of the things that went wrong. And the the defense was was they this was their first game where they did get just flat out beat and. This wasn't my first thing I wrote down for this category, but I'll get right to it. And I think this for for all the praise that we gave him a week ago, I have to say, Ryan, I think that in the second half in particular, Leslie Frazier got out coached. I think that Tennessee totally had him guessing, had him on his heels. The Bills really had no answer for not just Derrick Henry, but because Derrick Henry was, you know, running for seven, eight yards per carry in this game, a play action pass was just destroying them because Milano and Edmonds had to respect the run with Henry. And they were coming up so far into the box that right over the top of them, you know, they were just running AJ Brown across the formation. It was just killing them. They had no answer for either Henry or that play action pass. And, you know, Frazier just never could make an adjustment that worked for it. And, you know, he, after how well he did and schooled Andy Reid, uh, Vrabel staff got him, I think, on Monday night. Yeah, I, I mean, they want to live in a world, McDermott and Frazier want to live in a world where they could rush four and drop seven. And it worked perfectly last week in really making Mahomes 
uncomfortable and they just couldn't today with Tannehill. Tannehill came in as one of the most, as the most sacked quarterback when you look at rate in the NFL and Buffalo didn't get him on the ground once. And I don't know how much teams were blitzing him prior in prior games to kind of affect that number versus rushing four. But I think at some point you have to make an adjustment. If if they're eating you alive on defense because you're not getting home and you're giving Tannehill time to throw, then you need to change something up. And and Frazier just didn't, you know, they came out strong. Those first couple of drives look like just classic smothering drives by the defense. Poyer gets an inter even even after the point even after the Derrick Henry run, Poyer gets an interception. And this and they just they couldn't respond to the counterpunch that that Tennessee had. And, you know, I do you think, you know, I, the big talking point in this game, I think coming into the game, that was a big surprise was not was sitting AJ Epinesa, who had been at least early in the year, a really successful press rusher at generating pressure. So are you second guessing their decision to bench Epinesa in favor of uh, F.A. Obata in this game and and even Harrison Phillips? So, yes, I actually thought Harrison Phillips played a good game and frankly wouldn't mind seeing some more of him. He even had a great pressure on Tannehill, almost got a sack in this game. So I actually like what I saw from Harrison, but Obata, I was not impressed with. Um, I, I During the game, I noticed that he was struggling. Uh, and then I know I was listening to, I believe it was the shop podcast uh, today with uh, uh, Matt Prino, Ryan Talbot. And they were saying that, you know, Ryan, uh, or not Ryan, uh, from Matt Prino from the press box was saying one of the things he wrote down was, you know, Obata got kind of beat up in this game. He, you know, he, he jumped off sides. He got put out of position a little bit. And not to mention, I, again, take, put, put as much stock as you will in PFF. I, I don't love them, but for whatever it's worth, Epines is the highest graded run defender on the Bills. You know, I know he's slimmed down. He's not the big beefy guy you would expect to want to have against Derrick Henry, but you know, I would have preferred, I think, to see Epinesa in over uh, o- Obada. And not to mention that I just think Epinesa just gives them just more just explosive plays, both against the run and the pass because of his quickness. You know, I just thought the Bills were just the D-line, they went a little too heavy, I think, and were, were a little too slow specifically like on the, you know, when they won those really heavy base packages against the run. I mean, yes, you want to have guys who can hold the point of attack, but you also need someone to just penetrate in the backfield and make a play. And it felt like a lot of times when Henry was running that ball, he wasn't hit. He was, he was never, it seemed like deeper into this game. He just was never getting hit in the backfield, you know? So I would have liked to see personally Epinesa in overall Bada. I don't know if you feel the same way, Ryan, but that that's personally for me. It you know it it was an interesting move to go into this because I think Effie Obata is very much more the pass rusher than the edge setting uh, run defender, and maybe they saw that Tannehill, you know, they saw how the rate at which he was getting pressured, and they thought they could capitalize on that by bringing someone who specializes more in getting after the quarterback than getting after the running back. It you know in retrospect, yeah, maybe it would have been great to have a, a longer arm defender in there. I, I you know I think there's something to the fact though that you know he's not a guy who generally they run to the outside with a ton. He you know that that 75 yard excuse me 75 yard touchdown went right down the middle, right down the gut. You know the touchdown kind of went to the outside. I don't know how much he would he would have helped there because he's just a really hard guy to bring down in the red zone like that. So I, I don't think it was the deciding factor in this game. I'll be, you know, I, I think it's something to monitor to see if they if they use that 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 grouping again or whether they go back to Epinesa or you know maybe it was a rest day. We don't know because that I mean that position group is just so deep, and you know maybe McDermott just over tinkered with it and and because they were really good last week against a line that was good and this was a line that hasn't been good. Taylor Luan went out early and they didn't capitalize. So does it change the course of the game? Probably not, but I think, I don't think we'll see Epinesa or, excuse me, Obata over uh, 
uh, at Vanessa again. And I think in general, Ryan, you can kind of say with this game, like the Bills just got beat in the trenches, I think, on both sides of the ball. When, when you really also look down on it, I mean, that was the first thing I wrote down was what went wrong for Buffalo. Obviously, we talked about on the defensive line for, for the most sacked quarterback in football, all the Bills could do. They got no sacks, two QB hits. That's it. And that's also talking about Taylor Wan leaving the game early, like you mentioned, who is their all pro left tackle, right? I, and of course, you know, they struggled to stop the run. I know that's a team effort. I know all 11 guys had to chip in to stop the run, especially against Derrick Henry, but it does start at the line of scrimmage and they were getting beat down there. And then on the other hand, the offensive line, I thought this was not one of the best games. One with this was one of their worst games we had seen from them. Allen got sacked three times, was under a lot of you know, a lot of pressure. They couldn't really establish the run. And Spencer Brown, as much as we praised him, and I still do believe a lot in Spencer Brown. I think he's his end result is going to be a really fine tackle in the National Football League. But last night he struggled a lot. Dawkins had a couple penalties like it, it, that. They just up front on both sides of the ball. I thought just weren't right. They just weren't playing quite like at that level that we saw for them a week ago against Kansas city. Yeah. I, I, I have in my notes deja vu to the Steelers game because they were able to get Josh out of the pocket. He, he was probably he looked like he was leaving the pocket a little bit earlier than he normally does too because of some of that stuff that they were doing they were really it seemed like they were really confused by those stunts early on Mitz Morris who had the Ryan curse this week of me glowing about him and being a dick on Twitter to people because they they wanted Don Feliciano to start over him last year and I glowed about him and and he was not good in this game the interior line as a whole wasn't in this game and there was two or three plays early in the game where they showed Mitch Morris just getting knocked on his butt. I think he'll be fine in the long run, but today was just not a good game. And he admitted it after the game that it he wasn't going to have a lot of fun watching film that week. So the, the issues that we knew coming into the year kind of reared their head again. And I don't know. And what we can get into, we're going to talk about things that change the bye week now, but it was just another a second example now of a team just taking advantage of the weakness the Bills have in their interior line. And I, I think another storyline is that even Dawkins, you know, I question, you know, Bruce, Bruce Nolan put out some stats today regarding his pressures and stuff. Make, I think makes it look a little bit better than it is. I, I It still seems like he's not totally back from COVID, which is understandable, but he's a guy that this offensive line relied on to be the the anchor on that line and really be the best lineman on that line. And I think him playing a little bit below his abilities all is been a big that uh, has been a big drag on this offensive line as well. And it's it's not his fault. You know, it COVID's really hard to come back from as Tommy Sweeney, but it it's something that is I think really affected the line as a whole. Maybe the bye coming here is, is may, you know, is a blessing for for the line and him as a whole. Definitely, definitely, and hopefully they can figure that out. But you know, like you mentioned, when, you know Bruce put out a put out the stats and Dawkins with pressures and penalties, and he said that overall they are about his sort of career averages. But they, but he has already committed, I think, more penalties or as many penalties this year as he had all of last year. And in general, I thought penalties once again hurt the Bills a lot in this game too. Um, they had, they finished the game with eight penalties. Uh, last week, I know that game last week was horribly officiated, but they still had 10 penalties in that game against the Chiefs. Eight this week, and the penalties this week, Ryan, felt like they were just absolute killers for the Bills. I mean, you had the Emmanuel Sanders holding that took off that Dawson Ox touchdown. You had, obviously, the holding on Andre Smith that took away that Isaiah McKenzie kick return touchdown that probably would have won the game had he not held. So it, this game for the Bills with penalties... It wasn't good. It hurt them. And it's becoming a little concerning, I think, Ryan, where this team, they when they commit penalties, and I, I was telling this to my friends last night, um, at times, you know, it almost feels like the Bills are almost their own greatest enemy, where it's not the other team making plays that stop the Bills. It's them shooting themselves in the foot by committing, you know, penalties and making mistakes that hurts them. And I feel like we saw that 
a couple times in this game against Tennessee where if they just simply, you know, didn't commit a penalty or didn't, you know, you know, whatever it might be that you know, this could have been a different game. Right. I mean, it goes back to Kansas City last week, too, you said, right? It, that, that Zach Moss ended up being a touchdown anyways, but the Zach Moss run that got called back because Dawkins was kind of had a had an unnecessary hold. And, you know, I think some of it is I haven't seen the numbers on it yet, but I do think it's worth noting that last year the NFL explicitly was calling less holds. It was I, I forget if it was a it was an amebo, but they were explicitly trying to call less holds. I don't know if there's been a shift back to that this year. And it just happens to be burning the the bills particularly bad. And I don't luckily to, you know, this is a game where the offense didn't really stall out more than two times in this game and had the pick, but it playing behind the sticks is not sustainable. As good as Josh is, he's most dangerous when you can get him on schedule, get him in second and medium second and short and let him work from there. So that's something that absolutely needs to be fixed. And, you know, there was, there was the, the whole, the, I think the one of the key plays in the game was that hold in the red zone. I think it was, that was the Emmanuel Sanders one, right? that Mm -hmm. took him out and you know because i think the one thing that people were harping on early i know you were harping on early on was was the red zone efficiency in this game and the red zone efficiency overall we talked about a little bit last week that you know we beat kansas city and it was fine but they still need to find ways to capitalize and the last week it didn't come back to hurt them and the last couple games it didn't come back to hurt them but in a close game Four points was the game. Four points was the, was the margin, or three points was the margin of victory, but four points would have won in the game. So you convert there, and that's the game. We're not we're, we're having a great podcast here, and we're talking about the five and one bills as opposed to the four and two bills now. So finding ways to convert those opportunities is a must. I you know I, I think if we're talking about fourth downs, I think the the first red zone conversion. A uh, red zone opportunity when I think they were inside the five would have been a a good time to also go for it. Honestly, that I I think they missed, but it, it's something that as they play higher stakes games and they'll have a good stretch here where they're playing not very good teams, but when they get into these high stake games, they need they they need to they need to they need to capitalize in those spots. Yeah, I mean they they the red zone offense all season has been not gr- great. And they've kind of gotten away with it, I think, the last couple games, just because they've won by so much. It, ha- it hasn't come back to bite them. Well, this week it bit them. And like you mentioned, Ryan, just one of those two red zone possessions they had, the first two they had, where they settled for field goals, right? If just one of those is a touchdown, not only are we, I mean, it, it, we're talking about it builds up double digits immediately, like within the first 20 minutes of this game, you know? So, and for the Titans, because the thing is, which, which I think killed the Bills, because obviously the game plan for the Titans is you need to make it so that the Titans have to abandon the run game. And the easiest way to do that is just to get up quick, yep. right, and build the lead. And I think that's kind of what this game came down to, which is why I'm kind of pulling it in here with the, with the red zone trips and the lack of touchdowns, is that at the end of the day, the Titans never once ever had to abandon the run in this game. The entire 60 minutes on every drive, they were still able to run the ball because of the, you know, the time, the score, whatever it might be. And I think that's a large part. Again, I mean, they went two of five on touchdowns in the red zone. And listen, they know that's not acceptable. They were very, you know, obviously they're the biggest critics of themselves, you know, Josh Allen and the, and the entire team. But, you know, they got to score better in the red zone because, they're, you know, they're doing all the hard work. They're marching down the field. They're converting first downs. They're hitting on the plays they need to hit on, you know, and then they just kind of can't get it done. So hopefully they can get that going because like you said, Ryan, when the stakes get high and they're playing really top-notch teams later in the season, like we just saw last night, settling for a few goals just is not going to get it done. Yeah. If, if Bills go up 14, nothing or even 10, nothing early in that game, it changes, I think, the entire script for Tennessee. You saw how slowly they kind of matriculate downfield, the way they want to dictate the pace. It felt like the Bills were barely on the field in that second half of the game. And if you force them to get off schedule and you force them out of 
positive game scripts and, and run friendly game scripts, it I think it takes away it do, it takes away a good portion of of who they are, their identity, and what they want to do as an offense. Now, with all that said, and red zone stuff, yeah, all that red zone stuff being said, and how they got to capitalize, you know, some of the things that went well is despite the red zone, this offense was really good last night or yeah really good last night recording on tuesday it was really good last night josh allen was more specifically josh allen was really good last night he 74 percent passing 354 yards of passing three touchdowns the pick that came off up off uh, a tip off the no he was hit tip pass slash getting hit whatever you want to call it and he was good he he was moving the ball was hitting balls that throws at all levels of the field today all right, Monday night, and this offense did what you need an offense to do. If your offense is putting up 31 points, if your quarterback is playing that well, you need to do enough on defense. It is on your defense to win you that game. 31 points, I don't I don't have any stats on how often teams who score 30 points wins games, but I'm sure it's plenty, and that that's got to be if your offense is getting there, your defense has got to carry their weight. And I don't. I saw complaining about the offense a lot on on Twitter. I saw I was reading Joe Briscalia before this, and I I saw that people criticize. And I have it, and I'll talk about it a little bit later in my because I have it as a key point in the game. But well, Josh missed some reads there, and Josh missed some reads here, and he could have had Tommy Sweeney in the flat, or he could have had this guy here. No quarterback's gonna play the perfect game. No quarterback's gonna hit every single read. But Josh played the way an MVP, $258 million quarterback is supposed to play under the bright lights in prime time against another division leading team. And I I don't know if the, besides just getting more, you know, finishing in the red zone one more time or two more times, this offense moved the ball the way you want an offense to move the ball. And tw- even more, 28 first downs, 417 to total yards. I, I there's not a whole lot more even after we talk about that red zone stuff that I think you really need to see from this offense last night. Yeah. I mean, what, I mean, I wrote it for, for, for we're talking about, you know, what would write the, the first thing I wrote was Josh Allen was the man. He was the man for them last night. He did everything for them. He was their leading rusher. He threw for over 350 yards. He completed over 70% of his passes. And once again, I know it ultimately did win them the game, but God damn it to see our quarterback, Jump, try to jump over another guy to get the, get a first down. I know part of me is like, don't do it. I don't want you to get hurt. But you got to respect that, that your quarterback will literally do anything to win a game for his team. And that guy is playing for Buffalo. And and uh, another thing with this offense, Ryan, that I was really happy to see was that we got to see Dick Sanders and Beasley all have good games in the same game. And I was waiting for that to finally happen because it always felt like one or two guys were a big part of the game plan, but the other guy was sort of, you know, quiet and wasn't really involved much in the offense but all three of those guys got plenty of targets got plenty of receptions were a huge part of the plan so i like this i like that i finally we finally got to see what that looks like when you have all three of them playing off each other and what that can do to defenses because when the bills got in that rhythm in the second and third quarter that was fun to watch to see them march down the field and just have them all running different routes and a different you know depths on the field and everything so i like that a lot I'll throw in that, you know, Tyler Bass. I thought he was pretty, he's been automatic for them all season. He hit that 50 plus yard field goal, which was big for him. Um, he's been good. But the last thing I want to talk about, Ryan, I think this is what, with Bills fans who are really upset about this loss. And there were some Bills fans who were even like on the point of, we're not a Super Bowl team. I don't think we're that good. And that was really irking me, to be honest, because when you look at it like this, okay, for Tennessee, for them to win, mind you, by three points against us it took a huge long run by henry a freak circus tip catch by julio jones right a deflected interception return to the 13 plus all the things we just talked about the bills that they didn't do well and that and they only won by three so i feel like those fans yes it sucks they lost it hurts it's tough i was you know definitely a little pissed off after the game the Bills made all these mistakes, had all these plays go against them, and yet they they still had a chance, a good chance, nonetheless, to win this football game. And I feel like you kind of have to look at it like that, where like, hey, man, 
if a few things go, if the ball bounces our way a few times, if if you know they were able to make a couple more plays, this is an easy Bills win. So that's why I feel like you know fans should just relax a little bit, stay calm. I know there's always a little bit of an overreaction after after losses, you know, especially to a team that we felt like we were definitely better than. But I, I think that at the end of the day, this wasn't like a Tennessee domination. This wasn't like last year where the Bills got blown out by the third quarter. You knew the game was over. You know, the Bills, despite, you know, how poorly they were playing, the mistakes they made, and despite the things that didn't go their way, they still almost won the game. When he says overreaction, we're looking at you, BF family chat. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, but, you know, I, and it, I, I think – if Buffalo plays Tennessee, maybe this is arrogant. Maybe this is ignorant. Maybe this is overconfidence. Maybe this is rose-colored glasses, whatever you want to call it. I think Buffalo, if they play 10 times, I still think they win seven, eight games of, yep. of that type of series. In one game, you know, in a day, one game does not a does not a season make. Does not – football happens. You know, when Bruce was on the show this summer – you know, we talked about stuff like this. You know, it's it, it's any given Sunday. There's a level of randomness to football that that you just can't account for sometimes. And sometimes you're going to lose games like this. I think ten, I think we sold Tennessee short with how how good of a team they are. I think we I think we discounted what the offense would look like with Julio and AJ Brown back on this team. I think we discounted you know, what Harold Landry could do as a pass rusher. They had better linebackers than I thought they had that, that caused a little bit of problems that, that ended up making the couple stops that they made to help take us out of the, really help them win this game. So as we go through, as you go back and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the question, Mitch, cause I don't want, if you, I, I can come up with a new one in case we pick the same one. What, when you look back at this game, what's the drive for you that defines this game? What was the key drive for this, of this game for you? So I I don't want to put this game on the offense because I truly don't believe it was their fault. But the, the drive to me that still sticks out in my head was that second to last drive the offense had the ball. That's kind of where, like you mentioned, where Allen, he took that sack when he had Sweeney wide open in the flats. You know, he has Sanders on the next play. Not saying he was wide open, but there was a little separation over the middle and instead he tried to squeeze a ball to... I believe it was um, it. Why am I Kumaro on the sideline? That was incomplete. And you know the Bills really at that point in the game because they had to lead. That drive to me wasn't about scoring a touchdown. More so, just you had to just get, kill the clock, convert first downs, and kill the clock. Take up time. And they were trying. And, and I'm not putting that just on Josh Allen. I think Brian Dable has a little bit of blame for that because. Frankly, a lot of the plays, a lot of the routes run by those guys were down the field. And I just think that that was just sort of the one bad mistake this offense made. It just came at a really awful time where, again, that just wasn't the time to try to get a big play. You have the lead and you know your defense is struggling. Just grind it out that four minute offense, kill the clock, convert first downs. You don't need to get it, you know, put a score up right away. And they were really, I think, just kind of pressing a little too hard to do that. And I think unfortunately it, 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 it hurt them real bad, but that to me was the drive where it kind of flipped because after the bills punted that one away, that's when I started getting real nervous that they were maybe not going to win this game. And, and I'll build on that a little bit. Cause it's, I have it down as the whole sequence. And if you zoom out, Buffalo gets their one stop again, the second half, they stop, they stop Tennessee and they kicked at the time and almost tweeted it out, but I didn't want to jinx it. Wouldn't have mattered. But Tennessee kicked what I thought was a pretty cowardly field goal by Mike Brable when it was, I think it was mm-hmm. fourth and five at like the 30, 35 yard line. Luckily, Randy Bullock, or I guess unluckily, Randy Bullock's a pretty good kicker and he made the kick. But I thought that was a really cowardly punt given the situation and how Buffalo had been moving the ball. And you go back to last week where it was a little bit different because that made it a two score game. But when Kansas City goes down, scores, make it 11 point game. And then Buffalo goes down and marches the field and scores. That's the kind of drive they needed there. And have they really that sack that Josh took that made it second and 17, I think really is the turning point of this game. And I struggle with the analysis that there's that 
that's the reason they lost. I think it's a turning point, but you know, I think part of the Josh Allen experience for better or for worse is that he's always going to be looking for that big play. And a lot of times he's going to hit it. A lot of times he, he's going to make the wow play, but every once in a while he, he's going to clutch. He's going to, he's going to take some time. He's going to try to let a route develop a little bit more and he's going to take that play. And, and you take that. I think you take, I think it's part and parcel of just having Josh as your quarterback, but that play and then trying to do too much to not not taking what the defense was giving him. And, you know, I, that smarter thing probably would have been let, let's get a second and a third and manageable and then try from there instead of making the third and 17. But have they do they have they go down and score, not even get a touchdown. If they can go down there and just kick a field goal, you know, that game is different because then if Tennessee scores at the tie, and then Buffalo is going down to kick a game winning field goal. It doesn't matter because they could have probably kicked the field goal as time expired in that game or pretty close to it. So I, I was going to try to come up with something else as you were reading that off. Cause we had the same one, but I couldn't, but <laughs> I don't think there's, there's really much else to add because that, that really was a big turning point in the game. So who is your, who's your gold star player of this game? Who played best in, in a game that we lost? I mean, it's hard not to give it to Josh Allen. I know that's just like the easy answer. Um, so I guess I will just give it to Josh just because, I mean, though he to me was the one guy you 100% could not put this game on. You just couldn't. I mean, Josh did everything for them last night. He was terrific. And I think had the Bills won this game, I think he would have went, he would have been talked about more, not just nationally, even just within the Bills fans. I think we would have been talking about how great of a game he played because it is kind of outshined by that fourth of one. Uh, stop and the and the Derrick Henry show that we that was put on 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 Monday night. So I'm gonna give it to Josh Allen just because last night, at least at least for him, I know the team didn't get revenge. I know they didn't get this monkey off their back, which is the Tennessee Titans for now two years they've kind of struggled with. But I mean, Josh Allen did struggle against them last year. He threw a couple picks uh, in that game that was on Tuesday, I believe, did all the COVID uh, rescheduling. Uh, but he came out and played a really good game this week. And certainly did all he could to win the game. So uh, for me, I'll give it to Josh Allen. How about you, Ryan? I also had Josh, but I'm going to change it up here. I'm going to have Tremaine Edmonds. Okay. He is for two, two, three weeks now. He's been playing really well. And I think we've been a very pro Tremaine Edmonds show on here throughout the season, even, even into the off season, we were very, very pro Tremaine Edmonds. And I think sometimes the, the knock on him is, well, he doesn't make a flash play. And I think that negates, a, that neglects a lot of things that he's asked to do by Leslie Frazier and Sean McDermott that are things that don't show up in the stat sheet, like taking away passing lanes, taking away uh, taking away receivers, stuff like that, that just don't show up in passing sheet. The last two games, especially today, he made some wild plays. There were two plays, I, th- I think he had two tackle for loss in this game where he stuffed or he either – stuffed or he got into the backfield and just hit Henry and stopped him full force. That was impressive. He had the play on a third down in the first quarter, in the first half where Julio Jones was going across the middle and he stayed with Julio Jones and stopped and he allowed the catch, but he stopped him. And, and, and I don't remember if that was the field goal. I forgot what point in the game that was, but there really wasn't too many flaws in Tremaine Edmonds' game. He's been playing with a man with it, like his hair's on fire. He's been having a hell of a season. He had a, these last two games, I think, have been the best two game stretches of of his career, really. And I don't think he's getting enough love. I know we had the player of the week against Miami, but I think the game he had, or maybe it was Houston. I think he had a better game these last two games than he had in Houston when he won defensive player in the week. He's just, he's been such an integral part of this team stepping up when Milano was out last week. And, and I think really did his job well, even as the defense as a whole didn't play well. So I, I, I won't, I want to take a chance and give, give a chance to give Tremaine Edmonds some love. Yeah. And and then to add on that real quick too, Ryan, it feels like Tremaine Edmonds has been playing, not just like, flash plays but he's been like physical i feel like he's really hitting hard like just really coming with with um you know coming with some fire like you said and it's been good to see because he is a physical specimen i feel like we've been waiting to see that physicality from him because yes he's fast 
but don't forget he's six foot five, two fifty. Like he should be able to really hit people hard. And and we've been starting to see that. So I agree with you. I think that he's definitely coming around a little bit. And I think that the Tremaine Edmonds haters, which there seems to be so many of them, I think need to kind of calm down a little bit. I think this guy's really starting to figure out how to how to be an NFL linebacker. But from gold stars to I guess this is kind of the equivalent of who's going to, you know, who's who's going to the principal's office, you know, detention here. But who who's your LVP for this game? I had Mitch Morris. I he just had some plays for me that in full transparency, I didn't get a chance to go back and watch a game pass today because it was last night. And I, I went back and watched the plays on YouTube, but there was multiple plays that I remember watching the game last night that he just got beat, got put on his butt, was messed up on some stunts and let guys throughout the middle. He wasn't great on that, you know, that, that whole left side of the line wasn't great on that quarterback sneak at, at the end of the game there. And as a guy who's your franchise center, he just he's gotta show up in that situation. I'm not concerned at all i think overall he's played really well this year but this game was just not a pretty game for him so i um i almost put john feliciano on this i think that he did not play a good game at all i've been pretty unimpressed with him frankly the entire season i don't think he's ever really looked that good um but i decided to go maybe with a different guy and i just think because his mistake i think ended up being when it was all said and done arguably the most costly and in general i don't think he's played that great and that's andre smith uh, the special teams linebacker, he had two penalties last night. He had a blindside block that was a 15-yarder that backed the Bills up. I believe the Bills still scored on that drive, but still, you, you know, there's just no reason for that. And then, of course, he's holding on that McKenzie, uh, you know, kickoff return touchdown, which I'm not sure that guy was going to stop McKenzie either. I mean, McKenzie is a 4-3 guy. I mean, he's super fast, and that hold happened when they were kind of even with each other. And I think McKenzie's one of those guys where, you know, you're even, he's leaving. and at the end of the day, the Bills didn't score a touchdown, and that kick return touchdown could have won them the ball game. Because you have to think that, like I mentioned, right? Like the the Titans never abandoned that run. Well, guess what? In a two minute drill, they're not running the football, so you have to like you know our defense's chances against their two minute offense. So for me, it's Andre Smith. I just think that his mistake that that holding on that kick return was just. I mean, listen, I'm not disagreeing. It was a hold. It was just an awful hold to have because again it, it ended up you know sort of losing the game inadvertently you know i love the new numbers i love that you have weird numbers and new positions but single digit linebackers i hate that's the one that i yeah, can't me get too. behind not about that so I, I think it's his fault from going to 50 whatever he was <laughs> to number nine uh had he stayed 50 he probably would have been fine but it's andre i think if you want to be better if you listen to the show which i know you probably do Get rid of nine. It's a bad linebacker number. Go back to a normal linebacker number, and and I think you'll see some improvement in your play. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, it's now the bye week, though, and it's weird now that we're not gonna have, uh, we're not gonna have a Bills game this week. But that doesn't mean that it's not all bad. I I actually do think that after a game like that, having the bye week is a good thing. It lets them, I think it allows this team to really kind of look at the mirror and. Make some adjustments because as, as as good as I think this Bills team is and as good as I think everybody thinks this Bills team is, um, they do have some things they should address and probably change. So starting with the offense, Ryan, is is do you see and if you do, what is specifically an area that you think that needs to be addressed in during this we, bye week? I think we need to stop pretending that we need balance on offense. And maybe yesterday yesterday's not the best example, but Still, I there's been a more second and long runs or second and ten plus runs that I've seen that I just haven't loved. And there was all this love early in the year. Well, look, they're more balanced. Oh, look, they're running more. And it's it's no, it's it's you know, we we're a fair we are, I think, a Zach Moss RB1 podcast. Even with that, the run games just hasn't been there this year. They're 18th and run DVOA in the league this year, and it, it's just not who they are as an offense. And when Josh is your best player, and, and I think what makes it unique is because he, he can do so many things. He's not just a quarterback. He You can use him in the run game. You can He's really a weapon. I'm just not in favor of this, this artificial idea that you need to take the ball out of his hand and give it to a running back to set up these other things. Sure, it would be nice if we could get more of our running backs, but – just stop, stop pretending that we're a running team. 
go full. I love that we passed 47 times yesterday. Let's keep doing it. Let's let let's lead right into what we did last year and let's lean right into what we did last year with passing it. I don't care if we pass 60 times a game. This is a passing team. Keep the ball in Josh Allen's hand. Balance is overrated. And let Josh cook, as the kids say. <laughs> Hey, we and, and we've said it all. I feel like all off season, it was never about run more; it's about run better. And I think they've run a little bit better than what there was last year. But like you said, they the problem is I think that you know, like you mentioned, they did a lot of runs on first and second down. It was just putting them behind the chains. It wasn't it wasn't helping them. And I know that you know the old school guys will tell you, you got to establish the run. But like you mentioned, this offense just from how they're built on all perspectives, it's just not a running offense. Sure, could they run the ball a little bit better? Yeah, I guess, but they've invested quite a bit into the weapons around Josh Allen. The offensive line, all five lines, I, I would say, outside of maybe Spencer Brown, have a, are definitely stronger pass blockers than they are run blockers. So it's just how they're built. And we'll see if they can run the ball a little bit better, but I agree with you. I do think that at the end of the day, this is a run-first offense. For me, though, they are the offense that I would like to see more out of, I think, is the offensive line. And more specifically, they just need to be more consistent. I think they've been very inconsistent all season. We've seen them when they've been very good. I thought Kansas City was one of their better games. I thought um, you know, they had a good game against Houston. I know it's the Houston defense, but they seem to give Allen ample time in that game. But again, last night was a struggle. And I, I, I got to be honest, Ryan, I'm curious to see if maybe the Bills start to give Ike Bucker a few looks at left guard instead of John Feliciano. I know they love the kind of tenacity, the aggressive he's, he, he plays with, but like, you know, I know you're not the biggest Mongo advocate and, and I've not been impressed with him this season. So I think that, you know, I know that Ike Bucker isn't the, the most flashy name that everyone wants to see, but I, I think that they have to, you know, figure out what who really are their best five guys, truly, game to game. Because I feel relatively confident about the other four, but that left that guard position, the left guard has just hasn't felt right all season, whether it's been Cody Ford or Feliciano or Ike. And I, I'm curious to see if it's Ike or I'm curious to see now as we're getting a little bit closer to the trade deadline, if they make a move and try to bring in a veteran offensive lineman that is on a team that's tanking right now and try to see if they can just get someone in there who can just at least be a solid starter at that position. Because honestly, through six games, they haven't really gotten that out of anyone at left guard. Yeah, I I, I have get the align, find an alignment that works on this team. That's good foreshadowing to our next point to guys to, to trade targets as we talk about the defense here. And yeah, I, I, I don't think there's much more to say. They got to find something that worked. That's not working. I, you know, I don't think there is a super big difference between Ike and Feliciano. I thought Ike did a pretty good job against Houston. Once again, it's Houston. Not much to say there, but I think you need to find something that works. I I know people say, well, you got to give them time to gel. There's not where week six will be week eight when we come back. So almost halfway when they come back to the season. And you, if someone's not performing, Mongo you need to get them out of there and you got to find someone else who can do the job. And I think the only person on this roster that's ready is, is Ike Bakker. You could talk about maybe Ryan Bates, maybe throw Ryan Bates. I know he's been mainly working as the backup center this year. So I don't know how much many reps he's getting his guard in camp, but something. And, you know, I, we're not always an advocate of just doing something to do something, but they need to, they, they need to change it up. Somehow I know they already have on the other side with Brown, but do something at that guard spot to to shore it up or at least light a fire under someone's ass. Absolutely. And kind of looking at the defense too, like some some areas where I think things could, you know, maybe get figured out. Uh, speaking kind of with this trenches, I, I this was something I wrote about. I'm curious, Ryan, what your thoughts are on this. For, 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 I don't know if I'm speaking, you know, nonsense here, but I – I, I kind of want McDermott and Frazier. I know they love how much depth they have. And I do like the rotation generally. I think ph philosophically speaking, it is a good idea. But I would like them to pick like 
eight guys that week to week, no matter what, are going to be activated because I still don't feel like they really know what. And I know, I know it's kind of matchup based, but I don't feel like they really know who those core kind of rotational guys are outside of Ed Star, Rousseau, Hughes, and Addison. You know, I feel like everyone else is kind of mixed and mash and. You know, like, like for example, like I like Boogie Bash. I know they've been developing him, but like, do they believe in him that he can come in or not? Like, I, I you know, what I'm saying, like, like FA Obata. I, th- I was unimpressed with him. I don't know if that's a guy that you want out there so much and play significant snaps for this team at the moment. Like, I don't know. I'm, I, I don't know if I'm explaining it right, but I kind of want them to just pick a core group of D linemen that they are sticking with because I almost feel like they have too much depth that it's like. It's it's hurting them in certain aspects, like we saw yesterday, where I think they just didn't have enough speed. They didn't have enough penetration ability. They just had big big guys that can hold the point of attack, and uh, you know I think they were just a little like unbalanced. I, I don't know if that's crazy talk, but it, it's something that I would like them to kind of stick with. Is just who are the guys that we're rolling with every single game when push comes to shove. I mean, I think we do. I think all of Twitter, all of Bills fans, would be perfectly fine if we never saw Vernon Butler out there again. That's that's one place you could start pretty easily with this team and you know it's only one game but I think F.E. Obata did show why he has been inactive so long and maybe they need more time to get together or to figure it out but you know I think there might be something to the fact that hey you have you know guys who are playing every other week or you know and I don't know if that messes with your psyche I don't know if it messes with your rhythm or your game prep or anything like that but I think there definitely is something to that. And and the one thing, only other thing I really have to add to that is, you know, I, I touched on it earlier is just find a counter punch when, when you're not getting home with your front four, like you have in previous weeks, find something to, to do different. I think they, they just sat back and they're like, this is the defense we're playing. And if you beat it, you beat it. And I don't think you can do that when it comes time for the playoffs, come time for high leverage games. I'd rather you take a risk. We've seen McDermott and Frazier be really good at dialing up unique blitzes, bringing in cornerbacks, bringing in safeties. We saw a little bit to start the year. And I'd like to see them get back to that. I know, you know, I I ate my I took my L at the Kansas City game because I was like, oh, we need to blitz them. We need to try to steal, we need to try to steal possessions and and stuff like that. And they didn't and it worked. But not every quarterback is the is the blitz shredder that Patrick Mahomes is. I think with other quarterbacks, you can take that risk and send a fifth or sixth guy to the quarterback. And I'd like to see Frazier be able to make that adjustment in game to help his secondary and trust the secondary to hold their own when they send extra pressure like that. So develop a counter punch, find something else that works when your rush seven drop a rush for a drop seven just isn't working. And I think the last thing I, I want to touch on the defense before we kind of move on to the next topic here is as good as the secondary is, and I think the Bills do have one of the best secondaries in football. The one thing that has kind of gotten them over the years is outside of Trey White, they don't really seem to have a guy they feel comfortable going against these big physical receivers. And I'm not saying that means go out and get someone in, in, in you know, on the, on, on the trade market. Though they could, though they could. But you know, we saw last night like AJ Brown was a was just the Bills had no answer for him. They had no whether it was Taron Johnson covering him, whether it was Levi Wallace covering him, whether it was zone. It just it just didn't matter. There's, they couldn't really slow a guy like him down. And maybe like a guy like Saran Neal, who I thought actually played a pretty darn good game against Travis Kelsey, is a guy that could maybe fill that role. I don't, I don't really know, but that seems to be something they kind of have to figure out because I don't think it's just been a this year problem. I think it's been just a general McDermott Frazier problem where these big physical receivers that can bully DBs because the bills don't have the biggest DBs out there. They kind of have gotten bullied a little bit by these types of guys. And they're going to certainly see some more guys like that down the road and in the AFC. So, um, I would like them to find an answer, kind of like what you just said. Just find find an answer for for when you have to go against these big physical uh, receivers. No, I think it's funny because we finally saw they they played dime against Kansas City. And I thought that was a good look, and I just think the issue is 
it's hard to justify taking Tremaine Edmonds or Matt Milano off the field if you want to bring Saran Neal on. It's fine if you have AJ, if AJ Klein's playing and he, you can take him off easily and not lose a whole ton, but it, it's hard to find a way to take either one of them off and go in the dime looks because of one, they're both high paid and two, because it's, I, I think, I don't know if necessarily take it off Milano or Edmonds for Saran Neal makes it better, but it, you know, that's why they're, that's why the coaches are paid the big bucks, find ways to, if, if Neal is a playmaker or if there's other ways that they can attack big guys to, to, to find ways to, to make those plays. Now, we've been recording a while here, so we can kind of do this lightning round. Are there any guys as we approach the trade market here? And we'll definitely talk about this more down the road. If the Bills decide they want to be buyers and they haven't always, you know, besides that Kelvin Benjamin year, they haven't really been buyers at the deadline. Do you have any guys circled as guys are just watching to see if, uh, if they could be potential targets because either they're guys on one year deals, guys in the last year of their deals, disgruntled players who uh Bean should be making calls make Bean should be making calls about to see if they can make their way to Buffalo. So I have three guys I wrote down real quick. Two of them are just veterans on teams that I just don't think are going anywhere. And one of them is on a team where he was the guy and just over time has kind of fallen down the depth chart. So first guy, Whitney Merciless on the Texans, they already kind of put it out there that they're thinking about cutting him, which is usually kind of the bad signal for we'd like to trade him. I know he's older. I know he's not the dominating player he once was, but the guy still has three sacks this season, six games, and is someone that maybe could bring some, you know, pass rush veteran presence on that defensive line. Now they have a lot of veterans, but, you know, Hughes and Addison haven't exactly been world beaters. And Merciless is still getting it done at his age on a team that really has no other threat outside of him. The other guy, Joe Hayden. Currently on the Steelers, he's been a little banged up this year. But when healthy, although he's not the shutdown corner he once was on Cleveland, still a very good corner. And a guy that I do think, what I just mentioned, he can match up with those big physical receivers because he himself is a pretty big corner. He's physical. And I think he'd be someone that could come in and, and, and maybe help him out. And the last guy, and this is the one that I don't know the Bills exactly need, but I but this was someone that I had my eye on actually earlier uh, in the offseason was uh, Marlon Mack, who... Once upon a time, was a thousand yard rusher for the Colts. Super explosive, legit four three speed, and I don't know if that means less Singletary, less Moss. I don't know who, but I, I I wouldn't mind if they like brought him in just to have him on the roster and see if there's anything left. I know he's had a ton of injuries. He might be totally done, so who knows? Uh, but those are three guys that kind of came to my mind that maybe would be like interesting guys to kick the tires around. Just see kind of what you know, their, their respective teams are asking for. I, I don't know, Ryan, if you had any guys you sort of had circled on your radar. I got two. I got one offense, one defense. My offense is a guy, he's on a two-year deal. He's making $15 million this year, but he's only $3 million to cut next year. I don't know enough about cap mechanics and stuff like that to know what the Bills would owe him or what they would have to do. But he was being chopped this offseason. He's on a really bad team. And it's Andrew Norwell, guard from... Jaguars. Now, mm, that's a good you one. know, I don't know whether he's been the highest, highest graded guard on their line. He's played pretty well from everything I've seen this year. I don't know if they would all of a sudden now that Lawrence is looks like he's figuring it out and, and playing some high level football, whether they would take away his veteran guard. I know they have Walker Little that they kind of want to get in there from what I've read today. But he's a guy that if there's any if Bean call, you know, call in. I don't know what it would take to get him out of there, but it if they if they want to rekindle some of the rumors that that were occurring this offseason, I think Gorwell is a guy that you got to make a call on if there's if they have any inkling to, to move him before the end of the season. And the other guy's a guy I've loved forever, played in a kind of similar defense. He's not having the greatest year, but he's also on a team with like twelve good cornerbacks, and that's Kyle Fuller. Who mm-hmm. was cut from the Bears this year on the Broncos now on a one year deal. And what's gonna he was making nine million dollars. I don't know what how that mechanic looks when he comes on over. Not playing the best this year, but he's also there's a lot going on on that defense. And two time all pro or two two time pro bowler, uh one time all pro 
has played really, really good football over the course of his career. He's nearing that age. So we would definitely be a rental, the, that, that kind of that cornerback 30 year old wall. But I've always liked Kyle Fuller. There's been plenty of rumors already that they're looking to trade him because of other guys they have on that team. So Kyle Fuller is a name that uh, I'm looking for uh, come the trade deadline. And then our last, before we had 65 minutes now. So before we get out, we're at four and two now, Mitch. We, we've we seen we're about, you know, a little under, maybe let's say 40% of the way through the year. Have your expectations changed at all about this team now that we're sitting here at four and two at the bye? No. I still believe they're a Super Bowl contender. I don't think they've proven any reason to doubt that. And on top of that, like their schedule for to end this season is so freaking easy. I know that they have to play the games. I know these are NFL teams. You don't want to take them lightly, but Miami, I'm just being not, honest, Miami might not be an NFL team. <laughs> Miami might not be an NFL team. You, you lose to Urban Meyer. I, I don't know if you really deserve to be. Uh, in the NFL, but but that but that's kind of what I mean though. Their next four games is Miami, the Jaguars, the Jets, the Colts. They don't play a formidable, legitimate, top-notch team until mid-December when they go to Tampa Bay. I mean, we're talking they could rip off four, five, six straight wins out of the bye and be sitting somewhere between eight and two and ten and two or nine and three or something along the lines like that. And it's like, okay, we're right back in business. So, like, at the end of the day, this was a team that, before the season even started, Ryan, this game at Tennessee was a a game a lot of people struggled and said, you know, that might be a tough one for Buffalo. And guess what? It was. They lost. But 4-2 doesn't mean you're out of things. They have a long way to go, especially with this extra game. And they still have the easiest schedule in football. So, am I the least bit concerned about them? You know, my concern is zero. I, I think that they are still exactly the team I think they are and thought they were. Uh, and I think that they are still someone that could easily not just, you know, win their division, of course, but but really be that one seed and, and have everyone come through Buffalo in January. How about yourself? And just to give context to that, this, so these are the quarterbacks they're going to play up before they get to Tampa Bay. And on December 12th, they're going to go up against Tua, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Carson Wentz, Jameis Winston, Matt Jones, all before they get to Tom Brady. You know, and so to answer the question, if you want to do a thought experiment, is there any team that you look across, not just the AFC, the NFL, and you're like, man, that team is just on another tier. That team is another level than the Bills. Because even last year, you could say that. Last year, even as they were playing well, you're like, Kansas City's probably a tier, half tier above this team. But I don't think there's any team you go into a game and you're like, man, that team is a lot better. I think there's... I don't think there's a team in this league that if they play 10 times, the Bills can't win at least five, six games. You know, Tampa might be the one exception to that rule. And that'll be a good measuring stick. So if they take care of business, if they stay healthy, this is a phenomenal team. They've, they've ever since losing the Pittsburgh, ever since losing the Pittsburgh, they put up 30 points in every game. Their defense might not be that historic defense, but it doesn't need to be an historic defense. If we have a even a top 10 defense with a number one scoring offense, that should be enough to make this team really phenomenal. And I don't think there's really any recalibration. Josh, is the, Josh hasn't regressed at all. I think we can say that confidently now. And I don't think there's any major, you know, the offensive line is going to be something to monitor, but no team is perfect. And I think that's what people got to remember. I think people, People were coming in expecting that, you know, 15 and two are, yeah, 15 and two, 16 and one, all this stuff. And, you know, football happens. Football's happened twice now. It happened again. Steelers was a weird game. Tennessee really got up for this game. And I, I don't think there's any recalibration we need to do of our expectations. They are a top tier team, Super Bowl contending team. And I think this bye week, as it always seems to do under McDermott eras, uh, came at a right time. And I, pretty sure that someone if, if i'm wrong correct me in the comment section but i'm pretty sure mcdermott's undefeated coming out of buys i could be wrong but i'm like no, you're right you're right he's four and oh curve there we go mcdermott's four and oh coming out of buys we know what happened after the buy last after the yep. buy last year so really good chance and uh yeah that's all i think that's all i got on that <laughs> yeah 
All right, so it's been now almost an hour, 10 minutes here as we really kind of break down this game, kind of lead you into the bye week, but uh, we hope that you enjoyed the episode and are just enjoying all the BF content as well. Everyone's working hard, and now that there's the bye week, it's going to be, I'm sure, a lot of Twitter debates and discussions and whatnot going on here. So I know it's tough. We're going to the bye week off a loss. You hate to see it, you know, because it would have felt great to beat Tennessee, be 5-1 in the bye, but... Like you said, Ryan, out of the bye last week, this team was a bat out of hell. They were going crazy when that's when they ripped off all those that huge winning streak and led them all the way to the AFC Championship game. So uh, I don't think Bills fans should be too concerned there. So for Ryan Sullivan, I'm Mitch Broder. Thank you so much for listening and for your continued support. And I hope you have a great 